Greetings, and welcome to the Cell Portrait Gospel Podcast. I'm your host, Dakota Brown. Let's take a trip into a sonic voyage of music, culture, human expression, and above all, the minds of our very unique guests that we share a space with. If you like what we do on this independently owned podcast, you can always show some love by supporting our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash self-portrait gospel podcast. Thanks to all of our listeners and enjoy the show. Oh my gosh, I'm, I am okay. I'm, I am totally going nuts getting ready for tour, but it's good. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, as, as someone as with as much experience and being a veteran as a musician, is it still stressful and overwhelming? Of course, in a, in a good way to yeah. start yeah. full time. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. In fact, I, I would say maybe more so cause I gotten better at trying to do everything in a, in the best possible way. So I could over prepare now that I'm older. Cause you know, when you get older, you, you learn everything that can go wrong. So yeah, I, I, uh, it's okay though. No, I, I'm a, yeah, def- it's definitely like crunch time right now getting ready. Well, but it's good. Yeah. Excellent. Well, the yeah. new record is, the new record is amazing. It's, it's, oh, thank you. I love it. Yeah. I, I blew oh. through it probably two times when I first got, first got the kit and everything. And it's, it's a great record, Mary. Wonderful job. And oh, I, 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 yeah, I definitely plan to come out to one of your shows. Um, oh, let me know. Yeah. Let me know. Uh, just, let's see. I guess you could tell Patrick or, or, or whatever, but let me know if you need list spots or whatever. Uh, where are you? I'm uh, just outside of Nashville. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, we're not there until July anyway. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. To kind of kick off the but, summer. Yeah, because me, me and my yeah. fiance, we're, we're getting a new place during the summer. So we're, we've got a couple shows that we want to see where our finances can kind of allow us to do that in this transition. And I was like, right. well, the people that I've got kind of lined up on the podcast, those are those are the uh, the ones that we need to see this summer. And, and you're definitely on there. So we're... We're excited. <laughs> oh, thanks. Oh, wait, this is a podcast. Is this a yes. podcast? I didn't realize that. Yes. I didn't think it... Okay, so this is all. Okay. I, <laughs> I, for some reason, I didn't realize that. Um, and that's great. Okay. Well, <laughs> well there is, this isn't live. I don't, I don't do a live. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, thank um, God. <laughs> there's oh i'm sorry i just gotten confused i got so, a bunch of stuff going on and um and um i forgot i have i did check out the site um anyway but no um, worries okay. no yeah worries. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no worries well i'd love to just jump in um i love your guitar playing it's completely separate from your singing and your songwriting you're an excellent guitar player and thank you so much yeah, and of course you know playing other instruments i'm curious how did you how did you initially get into guitar like what what inspired you to start playing music yeah um well i let me see i always it's always sort of was something i liked as a little kid like i remember in music class just in school always really i don't know something you know a lot of little kids like music so uh, i think i it always was really exciting to me and um i don't know just like in you know a lot of little kids i i i don't know i don't think that's unusual (laughs) but um I uh, I did I I did take a lot of viola lessons as a kid from third grade till I don't know high school, and then my brother picked up the guitar and he started showing me some chords and stuff when I was like thirteen, and he started writing songs and they, his songs just like were so 
exciting and cool to me and so sad and awesome and I yeah we just had this like little we had um we would spend a bunch of time in the basement uh playing his songs and uh, he would teach them to me and I would sing and stuff and then I started writing my own songs uh and just you know I, I think I've always been I've always liked being creative it was like something that always made me feel better so I think when I realized you could do that with music at that age then I was just like pretty hooked and I, I think that's a pretty typical story of how people get into this stuff <laughs> but um but it really was songwriting that that did it for me well, like bro, listening, yeah. yeah sorry yeah well no, I was gonna say like listening to uh, learning all of the open chords on guitar and then listening to how the chords sounded together and what was interesting and you know what so that that's what got that's what did it for me i was like this instrument is so cool because you can learn these chords and play chords and then they sound interesting or they don't or they sound boring or you can make all these choices or it was that thing that was like really and then also like I started liking new wave music and you know rock music and going to punk shows a year or two later so it all sort of it's all a typical story but that's how it happened yeah and i mean growing up in washington i imagine you got to see the punk explosion of all the sst bands and the discord bands did you get to go to a lot of shows like Black Flag and Minor Threat and things like that? No, I missed Minor Threat because um, I started going to shows in about 1984, five, 84 or 85. I was in 10th grade, the first punk show I went to. And I still remember it, it was at this community center and um, Chevy Chase Community Center. And I think, I um, who was, I think it was, Dave Grohl's band Dane Bramage. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, I know. And then I, I know that's crazy. And then um, a band called Beefeater from DC at the time, and I I think it might have been Rites of Spring, but that's I'm I'm not totally sure. I've like tried to figure that out before, but. But anyway, so, yeah, um, which is cool, but I don't remember them playing, but I've looked up the show on the internet, and I'm like, oh, my God, I think that was, like, a Rites of Spring show. That's insane. <laughs> um, but at the time, I was just like, whoa, this is, what is this? <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. You know, I'd never really been to a rock show before, uh, and I was just like, there's a bunch of kids my age. They all look kind of weird, uh, which is it, awesome. You know, <laughs> um, they're like wearing weird you know, kids have these mohawks and like what's going on? There's a kid from my my class at school who like threw up on the floor. <laughs> it's like a crazy <laughs> scene. There's this loud, loud music. I, I I knew kids from my childhood there and um and they were blasting Hendrix really loud between the bands, which like really hit home with me because I was like Hendrix. So I, I don't know. Um, it was just a scene and it got me hooked. And then I would find out about the punk shows from Flyers or from like the local city paper thing. And not even that, actually, because a lot of them were in, the, you know, they weren't advertised in the paper. You just had to find Flyers at other shows and friends, word of mouth. Uh, so yeah, and it was all, they were all at community centers, it was all kids, and um, they were, almost all of them were benefits for Positive Force, which was like, it's still around, actually, in D.C., it's like a, this run by this guy, Mark Anderson, and there are various causes that they give the money to, but anyway, so it was definitely a whole like universe of its own and it was really inspiring to be around i would say yeah that's i i'm so jealous of your generation getting to see the explosion of 
new wave, no wave and punk because the older I get and I love so much, so many different types of music and from different, yeah. I know you do yeah. too, but like, man, yeah, yeah. I always return home. I always call it that uh -huh. with psychedelic furs or uh -huh. echo and the bunny man. Like it's always the eighties for me. And I guess uh. it's integrated in movies, you know, like you're, your favorite movies from back in the time, you know, back in the day. And you know, wait, let me just theorize for a second. Were you yeah. born in the early eighties then, or? I was born in 1994. Oh, Dan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, okay. This is my theory. It's like what you, what happened when you were a child. Cause for me, it's the same thing about the seventies. I just, exactly. it's just like the golden age of fantasy land. And I just like, I want to go back and like yes. experience and, all that stuff, you know. And so. and Mary, that's that's one of the reasons I started doing this podcast was because it's kind of a selfish thing. I just want to vicariously live through the people that I'm talking to because it's usually oh, it. yeah. you know people that I look up to because there's mm -hmm. kids that come up to me and they're like, my favorite band is um, Matchbox Twenty. Like we listen to that, and I'm like oh shit now i'm getting older like i see how this yeah. works you know what i mean yeah, yeah it's wild. <laughs> i know and and this shit's been going on for millions of years so <laughs> exactly. you know, like, i know it's like it's, we feel it's, it's, really not. yeah i don't but, know um, but it is it's funny i mean i think all, our culture changes so rapidly now that yes. it's like a decade is I don't know it's like any minutes like, uh, yeah but like you said you know that was a memory from your first show you're like did i see them was that another show and then you get on yeah. the, and the internet's like we have your memory we know your memory yeah. better than you do because it's yeah. you know like it's 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 that's it's weird awful. too i mean that's a totally like sea change like the fact that we can find out stuff like that now has changed everything you know it's changed yeah because it used to be that you had to remember or imagine or read a book or you know it's like everything's so all knowledge is so accessible and it's wild it's, anyway this is all obvious oh, you're <laughs> but, good. Oh. But, yeah it's <laughs> like changed change so much about music you know just the fact that we can like hear anything we want like and um I think it's changed how music sounds, it's changed musicianship and like how good people get and it's changed like, yeah, everything, obviously. Anyway, okay, so wait, so wait, what are we talking about? <laughs> oh, well, I, I was gonna, I'd like to add on to that because I feel like I caught my generation, specifically people my age, like, you know, me and my fiance, we're just a year, year or so apart. I remember going and buying CDs, you know, like I remember buying records at yard sales, but a lot of the time I already knew about those bands. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious to know how you got the different, um, how your palette and interest in music evolved when you were a teenager growing into eventually obviously forming your own bands. Like, like you said, yeah. it's a, a lot of it's word of mouth, and a lot of it's like, yeah. if yeah, you yeah, yeah. To, oh my god, totally, yeah, it was to all show. from, huh? Well, just going to a show, like you have to be integrated mm -hmm. into your creative artistic community to know oh, yeah. next show because it's not going to be on Facebook. You know no, what I mean? No, no, there was no way to find out, especially these punk shows because it wasn't. It was that scene what of kids making that music or that involved in you know the punk scene here was totally removed from like a anything to do with like the music industry or music or business it was more of like this i don't even know it was like a cross of like gangs gang yeah. activity like spirituality and and like people that really i don't know it was a really pure pure i think and that it wasn't like i don't know uh, also because dc is very you know 
it's not a music town. So there weren't any, like, there weren't, anyway, it, 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 you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like there was a big scene of, of older rock musicians here. So there's that. And also it was kids making up their own thing. Um, yeah, it was definitely something that would never have happened with the internet, you know, um, because before the internet, everybody had a, more of a feeling like make the, make it up. Like you learn about information, but then you have to make up a lot of stuff on your own because it's nothing's accessible. Nothing was accessible. But anyway, so you found out about stuff through friends and people still do that, obviously. Like, I, you know, sometimes I, I teach kids, sometimes um, I teach guitar and um, I always ask them how they find out about music. It's still from friends, you know, but it's just more accessible because they have their phone and they can just listen to whatever they want. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you had to like, you know, you, there was one record store, you know, there'd be a record store that you would go to and you would like find out about music from your friend that worked there. Um, and you know what I mean? Or like, you know, talking to people and, um, or, or you just, you know, had to pick up the local, magazine but i guess the thing that was interesting about the punk show is it was so removed from like from like money you know it was just like a scene um that it was there was nothing about advertising you know no one was interested in making money on these shows except because they gave almost all of them were benefits that were you know the money was given away to like homeless shelters and uh I met Mike did there because recording so, in progress. Are you there? Yeah, I think it just cut out for like seven or eight yeah. seconds, but I think we're good now. <laughs> okay, cool. I was just gonna say I got I got like a little bit confused when I started being and I moved I moved to a different town to go to college and then started playing music there and the scene there was very different because it was like, you know, bands trying to get signed and like uh, people interested in the music industry and I, I was such a sheltered kid in a way because I like come from this punk scene nothing was about money at all it was like more of a spiritual practice or or, or that or sort of like social a way to be social or even like gang related thing like with these groups of guys sort of like competing competing with each other you know that's kind of what the punk bands here were were um um and um so anyway so then i was like music industry whoa this is like a whole thing <laughs> i just had no idea and uh, like uh it kind of grossed me out but i i um but i also liked music and i wanted to start a band so anyway i was just sort of like confused I, I... Uh, but I, I also yeah the other thing about it is like I, it took me so long to because I, I feel like, first of all, another thing is my, my growing up, my mom did not allow my brother and I to buy records. That was like a rule in our house. So I was a little bit sheltered because I just, like I had tapes, I, I, but she did allow us to buy cassette tapes. So anyway, it was like this uh, like nebulous rule. Um, so I did listen to music. As soon as I got a walk, and then like music became more accessible to me because I would get tapes from friends and stuff and buy tapes and then I could listen to it on my own I didn't have to play it in front of my parents because <laughs> that was like a big no-no which is weird but it's just I don't know what my mom's deal was still about that um uh so anyway it just took me a while to figure out that like I don't know to like get get it all like like figure out what my what I wanted to do with music because like in one way like I was learning music in 
school. I was learning how to play guitar in this music high school that I went to. And, um, and then I would go to these punk shows and stuff and like that. And I liked, I liked, you know, music from the six, you know, rock music from the sixties and stuff. And I just, I just, it was so in my brain, so compartmentalized. I didn't understand that I could like just make up my own music. That was a combination of all those things. I felt like I had to join one, one of the things, you know what I mean? Like Absolutely. learn to be a classical guitar player or learn to, or, or say, fuck it. I'm, I don't care about learning anything and just play punk music. Yeah. I just, it just didn't make sense that I could just be myself. That took me a long time to figure out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. Um, and and on that journey, and to make this super clear, because it's it's such a I don't know borderline controversial topic of seeking out education, um, or obviously teaching yourself. I mean, as as black and white as that can be, but you know, obviously going to the Duke Ellington School of Arts. But when you went to Boston, you were going to school too for English. I always think it's super fascinating um, when musicians who are not necessarily trying to make it, and of course that means a hundred things, as you and, and you very well know that, but trying to make something happen to some extent, but also you're pursuing your education. You are going to school. And I feel like in the world of making music and making art, sometimes school is like, yeah. There's not room for it, you know, because as soon as you start oh, playing. I, I was thinking about that. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. I, I was just going to say, like, because as soon as you, because most of us start playing guitar or playing drums or, you know, instruments when you're, you know, a teenager. And yeah. for a lot of our heroes, I mean, holy shit, within five years, they were the Beatles or they were uh, Sonic Youth or something. So it's like they didn't have time for school. You know, they were riding yeah. the rocket shit. So, what what was that like for you to be pursuing your education but also pursuing a life as a musician as an artist? Oh, I I was thinking about this yesterday and about all of the the crazy artist rock people that I know like it's just a it's a lifestyle. It's like being a pirate or something. It's like a lifestyle. <laughs> you just you join yeah. you join this you know, it's like you join this artistic, like, pi pirate community or something. It's like, there's, there's its own rules. Like, yeah, you don't go to college because when you're 16, you start playing shows. And, like, everybody that I know that's, a, like, a, you know, joined that, did that. Um, a lot of people that I know who are diehard rock artists did that. Um I didn't take that path because I wasn't allowed to by my parents. <laughs> so I wanted to quit and, you know, not go to college, but they, they would have like fucking killed me. So <laughs> that's why I went to college and I, I, I'm glad I had that time. You know, I really am. Cause, um, I did, I studied classical guitar for a year at BU and then I, uh, I wanted to go to Berkeley uh, for music, and my parents would not let me do that, which is, it's all good. Uh, <laughs> I kind of wish I'd studied classical guitar for the whole time, but I transferred to English, and to be honest, that's like, it's sort of my, one of my favorite times in my life, because I just got to sit around and read books, and it was yeah, really cool. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know. I think I was kind of in hell for other reasons because I was like shy and anxious and depressed and stuff. But when I look back on it and you hear people say that, but I really, it was really fucking cool, you know, reading, reading a bunch. <laughs> but um, yeah, soon I was out of there. As I was out of there, I was like, okay, time to join the band. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, but it was definitely just because it, I, 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 uh, it. I didn't have an option to not do it. I guess. Right. Uh, but I'm, I'm really glad. I, I I'm very thankful that I did that too. So I don't know. It's weird. Well, I think I would have 
going to Berkeley probably, but yeah. Yeah. But well, anyway, yeah. It reflected, I mean, your your major has obviously reflected in your ability to songwrite because you're a excellent songwriter. Did you I mean, I and maybe you can agree to this, but do you have this understanding or um some type of interpretation that your major did really um kind of help you engage with the process of songwriting yeah yeah, yeah. no I, that's what I, I i feel so grateful for that time just sitting around reading all these classic books and like the old you know I, I loved my humanities class where we read like really old stuff, you know, like, I don't know, like Homer or whatever, the Bible or like Virgil. And I love all that shit because it was just a time, I don't know, it was a time for me to really appreciate great art. And that's always such a thing that feeds all of us creative people is like, um, you got to feed the artist inside you with great art, you know, to, to make stuff. And I think that's what happened when I was in college. That's what I got out of that. Um, and in terms of it helping me, I think it just gave me a chance to, like, read some really good words and maybe steal some shit. And I don't know, like... Um, <laughs> It made me a little bit better at writing lyrics than I would have been, because I look at the lyrics I wrote in high school, and everybody does this, but, you know, they're kind of embarrassing, and I think I got better at writing lyrics, you know, just getting more experience and stuff. Um, Absolutely. That, honestly, like, I, I really think that lyrics are kind of my favorite part of writing songs, actually, and it's the part I stress out about the least, like... It either happens or it doesn't, and I just don't really stress about it. Uh, but like the all the all, everything else about like arranging the song and coming up with the melody, the well, melody's okay, but like chords, uh, I just stress about that stuff. But the lyrics, in a weird way, it's kind of the most. I don't know. It's sort of the most satisfying, fun part that I just feel the most cathartic about or something absolutely i mean i can yeah. i can totally understand that yeah so i mean obviously by the time you got to boston um you know bands like mission of burma a lot of those guys had already kind of uh dissipated to say the least um yeah what, right. what, was, that, that, yeah. what was that scene mm -hmm. like you know coming from washington to boston which are obviously two great cities for music um yeah what was what was it like in boston kind of putting yourself in that community. I, I know you mentioned, you know, you were shy and anxious and I can totally yeah. relate to that, but what, what was it like for you to navigate that and to kind of feel uh, out the community? It was starting fun. Helium? It was really fun because there were so many different kinds of bands and different kinds mm -hmm. of music and different kinds of people. And the thing that was happening in DC, I was very torn because the scene in DC was, I think, really unusual and really cohesive and really supportive and really exciting. And there was a lot of great things about it here. But I liked being up there mostly because there were more women playing music mm -hmm. there. Um, there was this thing called indie rock happening, which is not happening he here. Uh, that I knew of, really, um, and I don't know, it was just kind of freeing to be there and to meet, and there was art school, you know, there's art school here too, but I don't know, I just, felt, I've had a lot of different kinds of people up there, but um, I met kids that were just, you know, just regular kids that, I don't know, DC is such a weird city. <laughs> everyone's parents are like you know like people move here yeah oh people move here to work for the government so there's a lot of like lawyers and 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 really educated people um and it was so nice to be around just like regular ass 
people in Boston and not like I don't know. DC is a very weird town. It's either you're either like you know, there's a lot of like what am I trying to say? A lot of people that use their brains, he, you know, for a job here and also but it's like really um I don't know. It's it's a, it's a, it's a strange it's a strange place to grow up, I guess. Um Anyway, so I just met, like, regular-ass, like, working-class kids that just wanted to rock out and just just wasn't the fucking huge political thing where everyone had to be, you know what I mean? It was, like, all kinds of people, all kinds of people, and people, you know, from different, different cultures, and I just felt more exposed to a lot of stuff there, and, um, anyway, um... Yeah, here it was either like punk or go go, which both were fucking incredible. But yeah, I don't know. Boston was just like there wasn't like a cohesive scene, is what I'm saying, I guess. Um, like, like you were saying, like maybe people in Boston or in Washington using their brains, and then people in Bo in Boston maybe using their their hearts or something in terms of like yeah. being a little bit yeah. more weirder and a little bit more. Yeah. That's eclectic. exactly what, you know what I mean. It's yeah, more freaky people, artists, more weird artists, and um, people just that liked music, and it wasn't like this punk political thing, and it wasn't so angry, and there were more women around, and I, I just, I felt, and also I was probably away from my family, so that was probably good, <laughs> I don't know, all those things. But um, I didn't start really, oh, I started going to the Middle East, actually, um, like, after I'd been there for a couple of years. Uh, and then that was a really cool thing. The Middle East Club was a club, I guess it's still there, but it had just kind of, they just started doing shows there before, right before I moved up there, I think. Um, and that was kind of like ground, the hot spot for all of the rock bands to play. And I'll, I lived near the Rat, which was cool. It was in Kenmore Square. That's where like the cars got their start. That was like, they did, a lot of rock shows there um but yeah i don't i missed Brit mission of burma i missed like um oh my god what other bands i missed the pixies um so yeah i i, I wasn't around for that cool stuff which those are my favorites actually oh man i i love love those bands and I, I, i'm yeah. cute I, mean, I have my own perspective but as someone that was there and seeing it breathing it and going on to start her own bands that are extremely influential for the oncoming generation. Um, what, what would you say is the difference between punk and indie? Like what? Oh yeah. You know uh, I mean? I'm, I'm just well, curious. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was going to say at the time. It was just so like, indie oh, bands, this is punk, you know, like, huh? Because huh? indie bands, they listen to punk, like your Nirvanas. They listen to... Oh, okay. Oh, my God. It you was know what I mean? So... Like... Okay, here's another thing that the the biggest difference for that I've noticed, like, before the internet and after the internet is that, in music, is that there were genres, and you were in a genre, and you did not, like, really associate with other genres. You know what I mean? Like, it was like... Like, if you were a punk, like, you would be humiliated and made fun of if you said you liked the Grateful Dead. Like, it was, like, the most uncool thing. <laughs> and, in fact, there was a lot that you couldn't like if you were a punk, which is why I didn't really think of myself as a punk, because there was so much that you couldn't like. <laughs> and that really pissed me off, <laughs> you know? It was like... You weren't allowed to like classic rock in DC anyway. I don't know about other punk scenes that were actually more artistic, like the 70s punk scene is different. I, I think I'm talking about post hardcore Discord scene, but it was like, yeah, oh my God, you couldn't like the Grateful Dead. Like people would like <laughs> laugh at you. Um, yeah, so it was like there was like a war, you know, it was like high school or something where there's like a war between gangs. Like, um so the, i just found that really limiting like i don't i don't know i didn't it's almost like the warriors like every like yeah the genre and it's like 
you know, like you said, it's like if you're going to a state of alert show or minor threat and you're wearing a Carol King t-shirt or something like Oh, that, fuck that. You'd be you're la acting like literally like <laughs> laughed at. Yes. It was so uncool. So th that is the one part of the scene here that I didn't... I mean, not everyone was like that, but you know what I'm saying. I, Absolutely. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, there was this feeling that it was genres were just so like, you know, it was like, this is what we do and this is what they do kind of thing. Um, more so than now where I feel like kids are just so open to like all eras of music and all decades of music and it's just just really different um but wait what were we talking about there's oh okay so like when I was in Boston I was really torn because what was going on here was really exciting and people were putting out records on discord and like going to Europe and like people were moving to town here and especially in the 90s it got to be even a bigger thing um and then the, like the riot girl thing started here and like bikini kill and bratmobile were in town in the early 90s and things were really just interesting and political and angry and it just there were, i could tell it was a really important thing that was happening especially with the riot girl stuff uh But, and in Boston, it was just like, I just knew some regular ass people, you know what I mean? It was just, it was like, and then there were people like bands that really wanted to get signed by major labels and stuff. But um, yeah, indie rockers and punk people were just, it was just different. Like it was just a different genre. Uh, and I felt like I was a, more of an indie rock person because I didn't, you know, I just was more aligned with that. aesthetic i guess and um yeah i don't know i just yeah i just i mean don't you were know yeah i mean you were in the viola in a jazz band when you were a kid i mean you had a very distinct um horizon in terms of what you wanted to hear i mean it, it's weird to be an artist and be closed-minded but at the same time it's like we put so much of our we bear so much of ourselves and our souls into our work to where it's like we all kind of create these little micro ecosystems almost like little echo chambers and then you get closed Yeah. to but Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I know what you're saying. yeah and Um. I mean, obviously with with bands like bratmobile i mean i fucking love bikini kill and bratmobile and it, those groups are so good um Yeah, me too. I mean, it changed, you know, that, huh? Yeah, The times were changing. I mean, the 90s. no, it was a, I really think that Riot Girl was like such a, because like the, the punk scene was just all dudes and, 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 and there was metal at the time, you know, heavy metal, hair metal, it's really, you know, 80s were, there was a real aggressive male thing going on in music, Right. rock music. And I think Riot Girl is just a really a reaction to that. That's the way I see it. That's what it felt like. Uh, and yeah, and, and definitely, a, you know, a reaction to the punk hardcore scene. Uh, but anyway, you know, that stuff changed my life, really. I mean, I was in a band of all, you know, autoclave. Of, and we were all, all, you know, it was all women. at the time too so i guess it was sort of a part of that here but um i just feel like um bikini kill and bramblewheel were just like fuck you to everyone and it was so inspiring to me you know it was so that anger and energy was so inspiring to me and liz fair too at the Yes. same time you Yeah, know and of course, when I was growing up in the late, late 90s, um, before I went to, you know, entered elementary school, I wasn't obviously growing up here in Tennessee in very rural county. I wasn't listening to, you know, my mom, you know, helping raise me and my brother. We weren't listening to Bratmobile and and Helium, but we were listening to like my mom would have Cheryl Crow and Jewel and Liz Fair CDs in the van. And I, and I remember, and I still listen to that shit now, even more so now, Oh, because uh -huh. like I legitimately grew up with these, and, and Alanis Morissette, but it's like Yeah. Uh-huh. these strong female. Oh, wow. 
voices. Cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that was just stuff my mom was listening to because she was, you know, 22, 23. Yeah. And it's... Wow, yeah, 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 yeah. So, Amazing. like, I really, really can relate to female oh. artists in that way. You know what I mean? Like, just oh, in, in a yeah. world of kind of aggression and... So I, I can imagine during that time you guys were looking around and it wasn't all just because it was more male dominant punk stuff. You guys were just looking around being like, all right, the slits did it, the raincoats, all these other uh, Lydia lunch, all these amazing female yeah. artists. It's it's our turn to, to turn over a leaf. Yeah. And Yeah. Yeah. Uh... And that kind of goes into helium. I mean what yeah what was your experience of getting that band off the ground and kind of having that early kind of platform or stage to really raise some hell essentially <laughs> uh, um yeah i mean i think when the band first started i was pretty i mean i had come from all this stuff so it was pretty um like vocal about my feminist feminism kind of stuff, you know, like angry, just You're because ready. like that was what a lot of us felt was anger. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, I would say the first couple records that helium did were fueled by that. And I quickly found out after yeah, I had that, you know, yeah, they were feminist, I was angry and stuff. I quickly found out, like, you know, by the, the time we did Dirt of Luck, that it's not so easy to talk about that stuff, it, especially at the time. It actually, mostly at the time, but I would say specifically at that time. It was not easy to talk about my political feelings in rock interviews, because I would be talking with you know, there were rock interviews and like older men who didn't get it. <laughs> and uh, I had come from this really idealistic, you know, punk scene where it was like everybody kind of felt these same things were right and stuff. And I just had this experience where it was kind of like made out in, in, in like interviews to be this crazy person. And it was shocking to me. And it, I just, I don't know. It was weird. It was a weird experience. Plus, it's just weird, you know, putting yourself out there in general is like such a vulnerable thing to do. Yes. It's, you know, and especially when you're 23, you're just trying to figure it all out and stuff. But yeah, I definitely remember like interviewers just treating me like I was a fucking insane person at the time. And it, I mean, oh. looking back, like it was just sexism and things were changing, you know, but. At the time, I don't know if I knew that. I just felt like it was a very different time. Absolutely. <laughs> it was a very different time. Yeah. Well, so, I'm just curious. Like, were you talking? Yeah. Um, just just to to to, to shed light yeah. on, um, as an interviewer myself, I suppose. If you, I I don't even know if I can call myself that sometimes. I don't know what I'm doing, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, no, you're just no. It's awesome. were you talking to yeah. interviewers that were like you said that were older. Yeah. Were, were they, I mean, even if they were 10 years older than you were when you were 22, 23, I mean, that puts them in their 30s. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. They came from yeah. a different generation. So, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So, yeah. what, where would these guys have kind of like, were they coming from like the Cream Magazine kind of? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, spin, like, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Older rock journalists. Yeah. And who were, you know, yeah. So that would explain when you look at like, you know, Nirvana interviews, interviews with you, interviews with, uh, I don't know, Screaming Trees, just bands that were taking over at that time. The interviewers really didn't, not all of them, obviously, but they didn't yeah. see understanding music more so than maybe just kind of getting you to say something stupid. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, yeah, no, it was, yeah, it's true. It's all about probably like selling the, magazine and stuff and nice. coming up with a good story and I, I don't know it just took me a while to understand how the music industry works well, it was just like 
idealistic artistic kid who was just like what is this oh god oh wait you mean if i say like i'm angry then you know they're gonna make me seem like this crazy person and like and then i was like fuck this bullshit like i just i don't know i i just got sick of talking about it and i just wanted to like think about like <laughs> making music and so then i kind of like yeah i just did, made different stuff and i learned how to behave in interviews so i didn't you know i just like i checked out is what i'm saying a little bit I understand. I checked out. yeah 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 well, think about it it's like you're making the music you're the artist you're the one putting in all this work that is your job but there's all these other subcategories of well my job for the paper, for the magazine, for the whatever, the publication is to talk to these said musicians. So it's like everybody gets these um, these jobs based on you having a job, if that makes sense. And it's weird. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, it I weird. can't imagine yeah. if there were like legitimate podcasts or, you know, things recording. Oh, about my God. Things are so different thing. now. Yeah, Things are so different now, even in the last five years. I mean, yeah. like, doing these kinds of things when you have a record come out is so different. Like, it's like we're actually talking and about interesting reason, things, yeah. you know? That, but if then it wasn't that. It was just like they wanted to come up with some, get get a bunch of dirt. You know, awesome. a gossip, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. We went to a helium show this weekend and there was a, this happened. It's, it's all it is. It's the same thing that's happening now with all the other categories of media. It's just to put bullshit out there to make people just spin out of control. And then they'll sprinkle in right. you know, classic world, you know, um, riding on water and the jet ski thing. It's, it's, that's what news is to provide you. Right crap to bicker and complain about but like yes. real journalism getting down to the root of what it is you want to talk about and uh, yeah, that is wonderful so yeah doing a podcast like this is a, is awesome because it's like we're actually talking about how we feel and what we think and like that's helpful to us and to other people like even if they don't like it that's helpful to learn what they don't like yeah it's just like it's in it's interesting it's it's real you know stuff not not just like a, an advertisement for the, to sell something yeah. so i mean obviously you know kind of moving stepping forward you know throughout throughout time you know helium being this band that you now are kind of the the controlling that ship as a as a pirate you know yeah <laughs> yeah so so to speak um what what was it like i mean obviously getting signed to matador and really kind of getting that experience of being a touring band and playing and sharing space with all these other bands that are obviously yeah you know, making it, it was, what was yeah. that experience like for you because it was cool it was cool it was really exciting and and really scary and hard and uh uh the whole time i i was, I was throughout my whole 20s i was like so depressed and anxious that I, I don't know and i my family didn't really approve of me doing it either which was weird so that was always like in the back of my mind uh my parents wanted me to <laughs> a lawyer or something so was, i was still like from a generation where this, or whatever, because of my family, I felt like I was rebelling, which is sucks, right. actually. Right. Um, it all that, that was, like, yeah. Huh? Well, it all goes through that pinhole of, like, not saying this is you, but just in the, in the, in the general sense, it's all going through this, like, pinhole of, take that, mom and dad, but you're on stage, like, killing it and making a insanely impactful splash for your generation i mean 30 years later people are still listening to specifically helium albums people that are um teenagers that are getting into the 90s because that is like 
the six that was how the 60s would have been for you and the 80s for me it's like they're getting into the 90s and your band is they're ready to be found for them to experience and to enlighten them but it's still unfortunately it comes out of that like i don't know the parents not agreeing and you know, yeah. it, it, you know what i mean it's, yeah. man, like, i don't want my whole like artistic identity to be just against my parents you know what i mean like it's it's difficult yeah. to kind of swallow you know yeah i mean thank you first of all i don't know for um yeah i don't i i hope i hope that helium resonates with people if it does that's like such a gift to me so i yeah i don't i have no idea if people you know what people think uh but yeah, no, I mean, it was a, it was a, it, it, yeah, it was hard, it was hard, it was fun, like, tours, some tours were really fun, um, yeah, I don't know, it's all a blur, but I, I imagine, I mean, you're, you're still I, a kid, and you're, like, you yeah, know, I, choking up like I a mean, spot game. I don't know, I, yeah, I don't know, in general, I remember the hard stuff, so, yeah, but I mean, the things that did work out about like records that I think, I don't know, you know, I, I have no idea. I don't know what, what it was. I, I feel like I've always just been trying to like go to the next thing and what am I yeah, doing next? Doing. Hopefully I can make this work and you know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't know. What, what, what inspired yeah. you to move back to DC and to initiate, you know, coming at music from a solo perspective? Because that's yeah. another thing that I find insanely inspiring it's especially you know one of my favorite artists um jonathan richmond from modern lovers it's like his him. solo career i can listen to that stuff until i know it's like i'm so fascinated with so your great. becoming a solo musician like oh, how oh. was the transition for you um it was actually kind of fun I mean, a little less pressure in terms of like, you that's know, what it, that's what it was. It's, I, I see my 20s in a weird way. I mean, I don't know. In a funny way, um, I kind of see myself, you know, jumping into the rock music career with a, a lot of energy and then slowly backtracking because I'm like, oh, shit, this is hard. <laughs> and people are going to say shit about you and like, do I, you know what I mean? So I, I kind of see myself retreating through my twin. Like I got in there and I was like, fuck yeah, man, I'm going to like do the shit. And like, um, and then I was like, oh, okay. What people are say, I'm crazy. Okay. Okay. This is hard. Going on tours hard. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm you know, you. sleeping on the floor and I don't like that. So, um, so then I was like, I, I, every record I kind of retreated a bit back into making it safer for myself. And by the end of my twenties, I did, I would do a solo record where it's like, I really didn't give a fuck. I was like, let's not even go to a recording studio. We're going to record at home. And it, you know, I was just trying to make it easier for myself, you know, retreating out of the career in a way. And also kind of just. Not giving a fuck at how it's, you know, I think like Mountain Sounds, I, I like it. I think it resonates with specific people who really are, are probably artistic, but there's the more general normal person that listens to that record does not like it, you know? <laughs> so yeah. maybe I was even trying to get less people to come to my show, you know? So anyway, and then I, by my 30s, I did four solo records, by the way, so I didn't stop because I just like recording and I it's it's the golden I dub X hat. I mean, no, you. It, I was you, trying a bit uh, more on that one actually. That yeah. was like okay, okay. Let me try to like actually put in some effort on it. You know, I I was trying on all of them just in different ways. I was trying different things out basically. But by the mid of my thirty middle thirties, I was like, fuck this shit. I made four solo records and I was like, this is just too hard. I'm going to stop playing rock music. And I did for about two years. And then I was like, this is bullshit. I have to make records. <laughs> I got so bored. And I jumped back in. But but and then since then, then I tried to approach music making as a craft and not really put myself in. 
I was just like, I'm going to figure out how to write pop songs that I really want to listen to and, you know, figure out how to arrange. So I did that for a while. I've just tried a lot of different things, basically. This record that I just made, I think it's finally me trying to do all of the things that I learned. And like, I'm in this record, I did not retreat. Like I put myself out there, my feelings are there, you know? And I also tried to craft songs that I like. And so finally, I, I like this new record because I feel like I finally was holding myself accountable and trying to uh, not hide, you know, trying to like really be vulnerable with my feelings and also hold myself accountable. Like, yeah, it's hard to get a good guitar sound, but you got to fucking do it. Even if it takes more work, like that kind of stuff that I sometimes would get lazy about in the past. Anyway, so this is, that is uh, my new record is me trying my very best <laughs> for myself because I, yeah. I like to do and I wanted to do my best for, you know make something that I I really felt like I had I, I put in a fucking model, a lot, massive amount of effort on and I I didn't just check out on myself you are extremely brave and courageous to kind of have the career that you've had because it's like you're looking around you're like this isn't for me I don't want this trajectory yeah. I'm seeing bands yeah. all around me doing weird shit and yeah. then it all leads up to Untame the Tiger, which there is a lot of bravery and a lot of courage throughout that music, whether it's lyric wise or just the tones, it's it's expressed in there, Mary. And it's your whole career leading up to this record is it's there's a lot of courage in that record. And I'm extremely excited to see you play live. Um, that's like the nicest thing anyone's ever said. Thank you so much. It makes me really emotional um thank you for getting it you know thank you for understanding yes. because not everybody does and uh, i really appreciate that and welcome it's your uh, music you create your music yeah no thank you for for talking this of is course, great of course so and, um, yeah, i can't wait to get on, on the road and yeah do this live and um so, yeah thanks for having me so much and um yeah and come to the show Thank you.